Hi and welcome back to lecture number five in CCNA2 routing and switching essentials with me Joachim Sjöverstad from the University of uh, Skövde. This lecture is recorded on a very on a day of high anxiety for me because it's Wednesday the 27th of June and Sweden is playing Mexico to uh, in a couple of hours in the football world cup and that is sort of making me extremely nervous and anxious even if I'm just a simple teacher trying to do some visual lectures and uh, having a nice day. So with that said, stuff that you don't care about, let's go on to this lecture, uh, which is about switch configuration. So what we're going to go through is default switch configuration, how to configure switch port, uh, how we can secure and uh, uh, securely remote access to switch, and we're also going to discuss switch port security. Uh, so uh, especially for this remote access part, you should know that there is some special configuration you have to do to a switch because it is a layer two device by default. So we have to do some, uh, some mambo yambo or some configuration to make it accessible through IP. So, but before we go, let's just, as Cisco dictates, have a quick look on the switch boot process. So, when you start a switch, much like a router, it's a special purpose computer. So, what happens first is that a power, of, power on self test is loaded and it tests uh, the CPU memory and the flash file system. So, much like the router, there is a flash memory in the switch. And then the bootloader, which is stored in uh, ROM, is loaded. Fun, uh, fun story, when I did the slides, the bootloader was actually continuously autocorrected to be bootloader. So the power, uh, PowerPoint thought that I was writing about something to lo load some boats. Uh, however, step number three uh, is when the bootloader performs CPU initialization. And then in step four, it initializes the flash file system before it locates and loads the iOS. Uh, iOS is the Cisco operating system and Cisco had the name iOS before Apple. True story. Uh, so finally, uh, in the both process, the iOS initializes interfaces using the startup configuration that is located in non-volatile RAM. Uh, and just as for switches, uh, the running config will be stored in RAM. So you have to copy it to startup config if you want it saved. Uh, so, to be able to do some uh, configuration, we again have to connect to the switch. And the default mode is to use a console cable, which is, uh, if you buy it from Cisco at least, a blow, bl blue uh, cable that is quite flat, which has a serial connector on one end, that's what you connect to your PC, and it has a, um, what is it, it resembles an R. Uh, RJ45 connector at the other end that you put in the console port of the switch. And this is what you have to do for initial configuration because there are, no, uh, there are no configuration to the switch yet, so you can't access it. But then uh, you can, of course, uh, do configuration to the switch so that you can access it through SSH. And remember again that I am continuously saying SSH and I never say Telnet, but when you do... Uh, when you configure a switch or a router for remote access, there is both the options of using Telnet and SSH. And SSH is encrypted and good. And Telnet is a plain text protocol that is highly unsecure and should not be used. And that is why I am not talking about it uh, that much in the courses. And I'm also not showing you how to configure it because you shouldn't. Uh, Traditionally, uh, and even still, Cisco teaches Telnet first because it's a little bit easier to uh, configure. But, uh, but I'm thinking that, well, if you don't know how to do it, then you're not going to do it. So you'll, you'll have to be stuck with SSH, which is far better. So uh, in order to remotely access a switch, we have to uh, configure what is called an SVI or a switch virtual interface. The way we do that is that we create what is called a VLAN interface. And we will discuss VLANs more in the next class in next class. But for now, what we have to do is that we have to assign an IP address to a VLAN. So we do that by going to configuration terminal, and then we just type interface VLAN and the interface number that we want to send a VLAN for. If the, if this is the only configuration we want to do to a switch, we should do interface VLAN one, which is the default VLAN uh, for Cisco switches. Uh, then we just configure an IP address, we do the no, no shutdown command, and then we uh, copy running config to startup config, and that's it. So with this configuration, we can access the switch from, uh, from another device within the same network, 
a device connected to the switch within the same IP network, but if you want to be able to connect to the switch uh, from the outside world, the switch, must li much like a computer, needs to have a default gateway, and we do that, we get a default gateway by saying IP default gateway and an IP address in uh, configuration terminal. And of course, the default gateway is the IP address of the closest router. Um, so moving on, the default configuration is much like the default configuration on a router. You do, uh, you, you get a host name, you set a console password to secure console access, you set a banner because Cisco wants you to, you set a password for privileged executive mode to enhance security, you configure the router for remote access over SSH, you configure the switch, for remote access over SSH, you configure the switch to encrypt all passwords, uh, and you configure a switch virtual interface to enable remote access. So, if there are any questions, put them in the comments field or ask a teacher. Now we're going to do the uh, switch virtual interface and the default configuration in practice. So let's get, uh, let's head to Packet Tracer and discard the notes. So we have a simple topology here that we're going to use for the next practical. And what I've done is that I have a switch that I erased all configuration from, and I have PC1. So the blue cable here is, oops, uh, cancel. Let me get that. The blue cable here is a console cable, so let's take it away. Uh, and what we're gonna do first, when we wanna connect to a switch, is that we grab our console uh, cable, we put it in our PC, and then we put it in our switch. So I'm doing this virtually in Packet Tracer. Of course, when we wanna configure stuff in Packet Tracer, we can just hit the device and go to the CLI mode here and we can go configuring as we wish. But in the spirit of demonstrating a console access, instead we go to the PC and we go to the terminal. Uh, and then we just hit OK. So this way we're also in the switch, but we emulated a connection over a console cable. If you do this connection on a PC, then you would you would need a software terminal emulation software such as TerraTerm that, that is free to download. So now that we're on the switch, what we're gonna do is a default configuration uh, first, and then we're going to, let, let me just move things around here a little bit so I can see what I'm doing. So uh, we're going to begin with going to configuration terminal and then we're going to set a host name and again we do that by host name and name that we want, S1. Then we do the console password and the console password is configured doing line console zero. There is only one line so if I do a question mark here there is only one line number and that is zero. So line console zero, then we do a password, Cisco, and login. Of course, you should do a better password in reality. And this means the, the password sets the password and the login enforces the password to be used. And when we do login, then we are enforcing the use of a password set like this. Uh, if I go login and hit the question mark, you can see that I can also do local. That's what we're gonna do when we do SSH access. Uh, and login local tells the router to, or the switch to, uh, to handle this login using the local user database. So if I'm just going to demonstrate how this password in action, I go end so that I uh, end exit so that I'm back from the very beginning. And now you see that when I access the switch using the console cable, it asks for a password. So I'll go Cisco and there we're, there, then we're in. So back then, uh, through enable and configuration terminal to set a banner, and the command is banner, M-O-T-D, banner message of the day, then some sign, then our banner, and then that sign again. And that's the banner. Next, we're going to set a password for privileged executive mode, and we do that with enable. Now we can do either password or secret. If we do password, it will be saved in plain text and running config, and if we do secret, it's going to be uh, to be saved with MD5 encryption, so I guess secret is always better. So enable secret, and again Cisco, and yet again we do end and then exit to demonstrate. So now we're back from the beginning. We hit enter, we're asked for a console password. You can also see the banner being pointed out here. So we go Cisco, then we do enable and we're asked for a password again. So we go Cisco again. Uh, and back to configuration terminal. Uh, next thing we're going to do is that we need to, uh, we're going to configure the, router, uh, the switch 
again with the router. We're going to configure the switch for remote access over SSH. So what we're going to do first is that we need to, uh, to create an IP domain name. IP domain name and we go with cisco.com maybe this time. And uh, then we need to have a user. So we do username, admin. Again, we can do either password or secret. So we do secret Cisco. We can also do privilege, which is beyond the scope of this course. And uh, so username, admin, secret Cisco. And then we have to do our crypto keys. So we do crypto key generate crypto key generate RSA and that's it select Moodleless and in this case you should know that we have to have a bit length or a Moodleless value higher than what is it 764 to enable SSH version 2 which is even more secure so let I'm usually going with 1024 and the higher the size the higher the security but also the longer time it will take to generate. But since we're in Packet Tracer, it's all instant. So that being done, the next thing we have to do is go line uh, VTY and then zero for the first line and then question mark to see how many lines we have. And as you see here, there are 15 lines available. So we go 15 to configure them all. And then we do login local in this case to enforce the use of the local uh, user database. And then we also do transport input SSH to enfor in enforce that only SSH can be used for remote access. So now at this time, uh, we can also go back and do IP SSH uh, version 2 uh, so that we have SSH version 2. Um, so now we have to configure the switch virtual interface before we can do anything more. So we do that by going uh, by by doing interface vlan one, and then we do the IP address. So in this case, IP address ten dot ten dot ten dot one hundred and fifty. This has to be an IP address on the local area network. And finally, we go no shut down, and it comes up. We can go exit, and then we also have to do a default gateway, which we do with the command IP, default gateway, and default gateway address. In this topology, we only have a very simple topology with no router in it, so the default gateway won't have any effect. Uh, and now that that's done, this final thing that we have to do is service password encryption to encrypt any passwords that are saved in plain text. And I'm going to show you this in action, so let's go do show running config and we can see for instance if we go to the bottom here we can see the console password being cisco um, but if we do service uh, password encryption and do show run again and go to the bottom you can see that now there is a hash value here this is a a very low form of encryption it's extremely easy to break using an online uh, some online service to do that, but it's, it at least provides some layer of security. So now we're actually going to close out uh, the terminal emulator here, and we're going to go through to the command prompt, and we're going to test SSH. So the command to do SSH within Packet Tracer is SSH minus L for login, and the username, and then the IP address that we want to access 150 and enter. So you can see that it responds and we supply our password and we're in. So that was uh, SSH access. So, and now there is nothing more for this demonstration. We're going to go back to our lecture and then we're gonna get back in a little while and do port security. So, um, the first thing that we wanna discuss is that I just want to remember you, uh, to remind you of those concepts of half duplex and uh, full duplex that this, these are modes of communication where half duplex is where you can send or receive over the same link but you can only do one of the th things at the same time. If both devices are sending traffic at the same time then there is going to be a clash. So half duplex communication is going to be the case when we have communication between a switch what is happening? Uh, between a switch as we are having here Okay, let's 
forget to try to draw the switch that we have here and a hub that's on the other side. But if we have two modern switches, they are commonly going to negotiate a uh, full duplex. So you can also configure the duplex mode on the switches. And the way you do that is by going to an interface with interface command, like fa interface fa fast ethernet one. And then you can do uh, use the duplex command, auto will, auto will make it negotiate the uh, duplex mode, but you can also uh, firmly set it if you want. The same with speed, uh, you can have the switch, uh, switch and the other end agree on what speed to use. Uh, both sides have to use the same speed and you can have negotiation happening with speed auto, but you can also set it statically. Then I also want to tell you about the auto MDIX feature. So auto MDIX feature is, uh, well, it's not a modern feature anymore. It's been around for a very long time. But remember from the previous course that, it, that you have those crossover and straight through cables. And if you have devices working at the same layer of the uh, OSI model, like a switch to a switch, then there should be a crossover cable in between those two. And if you have devices working on different layers, like a switch to a computer, then you can have a straight through cable. Uh, if you have the auto MDIX enabled on a router or a switch um, or the computer, then you don't have to care about the cable types. And this is most of the cases, the scenario. Uh, if, it, if auto MDIX is enabled, you can do it with the MDIX auto command. But as I said, this is most commonly the default. So uh, before we move on, we should ver you should know about some verification commands that you can use to verify the switch port configuration or the switch configuration. So first we have show interfaces that will display interface status and configuration. You can also do show, IP, show interfaces brief or show IP interfaces brief. And uh, maybe that's more useful for routers than for switches. So here we're basically stuck with show interfaces. So then you can do show startup config to display the current startup configuration that is the configuration that is saved to ROM that is going to be used when to be issued when the switch boots. And uh, you can also do show running configuration to show the current operating configuration. Then you can have show flash to show information about the flash file system, show version to show system hardware and software status. You can do show history to display uh, uh, the history of commands that you entered to the switch. You can do show IP interface and show IP interface brief to display IP in IP information about an interface, and you can display the MAC address table that we discussed before with either show MAC address table or show MAC address table. So uh, a little slide on how to troubleshoot port issues. Well, if there are port issues like connection isn't working uh, in some way, what you want to do is show interfaces to see whether it's up or, up or not. If the interface is up and the output of show interfaces actually shows that it should work, well, what you should do then is to see if there are any indications of electromagnetic interference or noise. And if there is, you should remove those sources because then it may be an external source that is uh, impacting the cable's uh, ability to work. And uh, if that doesn't work, you should verify the duplex settings and, uh, and that you have a correct cable on both ends. So if the interface is not up, then you should again verify that the cables are the correct ones and also verify that they are not damaged. And then you should verify that the speed is properly set on both ends. So speed auto and also duplex auto, that is the most common settings and you just have the switch work it out on, on its own. Uh, so if you solve the problem, then you're done. If you didn't solve the problem, you should commonly document the work that you've done and escalate the issue to someone better than you. Maybe someone that took the CCNA three and four courses. So uh, moving on, we're going to discuss how we can configure remote access again. And as we said, SSH is the preferred protocol for remote access. It's encrypted. You can still use talent, but it should, but you shouldn't because it's not encrypted. And I just want to emphasize this. That's why we're doing the switch again, the slide again. So what you do is that you have to go to configuration terminal. You have to do a domain name. You have to generate uh, crypto keys, which you do by crypto key generate RSA. Then you have to configure a username with a secret. And then what you do next is that you do line VTY zero to question mark and see how many there can be. And then you do transporting with this age and login local. And you should also do, do IP SSH version two to enforce the use of SSH version two, which is more secure than version one.
So how do we verify that SH work? And why am I putting emphasis on this? Well, because when we have practical assignments in my classes, students usually do most of the configuration well, but then I try SSH to some device and it doesn't work and failing because, uh, because you're not able to do a working SSH configuration, well, that's not very good. So the easiest way to test this SSH work is to access to the, access the switch over SSH. From Linux, you can do this using the command SSH username at and the destination IP address. If you want to do it in Packet Tracer, as we demonstrated before, you go SSH minus L username and the destination IP. Uh, on Windows or, or Linux, you can use the remote access software PuTTY that you can Google and it's available for free. So moving on, we're going to look on how we can secure unused ports. And when we talk about unused ports, we talk about ports that are not used to connect to a device. So basically empty ports. Those should always be manually disabled using the shutdown command. And that is because of the reason that if you configure a port that can be used, but isn't in use, then anyone can use it to input a rogue computer or a rogue device. And that's not a good thing. So you can actually configure multiple switch ports at once using the range command. So instead of going interface fast ethernet zero, uh, zero 01, you can go interface range fast ethernet zero 01 to 24, and then you will come into a configuration mode where all configuration you do will apply to all of these ports. So that's a very convenient way to shut down multiple ports at, at once. Uh, to increase the security on the active ports, you can and should configure port security. And what port security does, it's that it lets you configure what MAC addresses that can connect to the port. And you can also then, or you must configure a violation mode that decides what happens when a violation occurs, namely that an unallowed MAC address is accessing the ports. So you enable port security using the command switch port port security on the interface uh, configuration level. Uh, and let's look at the different ways that we can configure the switch to learn about MAC addresses. So there are three different ways to have the switch learn about MAC addresses. First, there is static secure MAC address, and those are manually configured on a port using the command switch port, port security, MAC address, and the MAC address that we want to configure. So the MAC address is configured in this way, will be stored in the address table, the MAC address table, and they are also added to the running config of the switch. So they will be there forever. So this is a static way to configure what MAC addresses can use a port. And this is quite a good approach for, uh, for servers or other devices that are going to be connected for a very long time. Uh, we can also do dynamic uh, secure MAC addresses and dynamic secure MAC addresses are MAC addresses that are dynamically learned and those are stored only in the address table so they will be removed when the switch restarts. So in this way you can configure the switch to learn a uh, one or more dynamic MAC addresses and what happens then is that the first MAC address to uh, connect to the switch will be allowed the second will be allowed, and if you con configure it to be allowed to learn two MAC addresses, then the third one will be a violation. So finally, we can have sticky secure MAC addresses, and sticky secure MAC addresses are the same as um, dynamically learned, basically. They can also be manually configured, but it's basically the idea is that they should be the same as dynamically learned, but they are added to the running configuration. So it's basically dynamically learned secure MAC addresses that will survive a power cycle. So moving on to uh, the violation mode and the violation mode is configured using the command switch port port security violation and then we have three violation mode protect restrict and shut down and uh, shut down is the default uh, default violation mode. So looking at a table here uh, whenever a violation occurs look beginning with the shutdown mode what's going to happen is that the switch will not forward traf the traffic uh, but it will increase uh, the violation counter as you see at, at the end and it's going to shut the port down and then it's going to get into what is called an error disabled state uh, if we instead go with restrict then uh, we are again not forwarding traffic uh, but we are increasing the violation counter. However, we're not shutting down the port. Instead, we are sending a syslog message, and we will see at the ending lecture of this uh, of this course how we can uh, how we can trap syslog messages and send them to a syslog server. So this is more of a way to send a warning to the uh, to the 
uh, to the server. And then we have protect, which is the weakest, if you will, violation mode. It's not going to forward the uh, the evil traffic, but it's also not going to send a syslog message. It's not going to display an error message. It's not going to increase the violation counter, and it's not going to shut down the port. Uh, remember that shutdown, again, is the default mode on Cisco switches. So moving on again, the the way that we uh, to to verification, the, the way that we verify um, port security settings is by sh doing the show port security interface and interface ID command. We can also do do show port security address to display the secure MAC addresses uh, on the different interfaces that we have. Uh, and as I said, when a port is disabled by port security, it becomes error disabled. And you can see this in the output of the show port security interface command. Uh, however, to re-enable the port, we have to enter the port configuration mode and do a shutdown followed by a no shutdown. So let's go do a demo on port security. And then I highly encourage you to do the skills integration challenge in 5.3.1.2. So. Uh, we're going to discard the annotations and then we're back in Packet Tracer. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to enable some port security. So the first thing that I want to do actually on the switch is to do some configuration to disable all unused ports. So if I begin going to back to Packet Tracer and uh, hover over the little balls here, can see that the ports that are in use is fast ethernet one and two. So let's just disable the rest of them. And as we said, we can do that with the interface range command. So we do interface range. And in this case, the first port to disable is fast ethernet zero three. And the final is fast ethernet zero 24. So the syntax will be interface range fast ethernet zero three to zero 24. And then we can just shut them down, shut down. And you see that all of those ports are changed state to down, meaning no one can access them. Uh, so uh, next, what we want, what what we're gonna do is that we're going to enable uh, enable port security for switch ports one and zero. We can do this again using the interface range command: interface range fast Ethernet zero one two two, and then we go switch port port security and enter. So those are dynamic ports. The first thing we have to do is configure them as access ports. And so what we do is switch port mode access, and that's going to configure them as access ports. Those are ports that are intended to be used for end devices. And then we can do the switch port port security. And um, next thing that we're going to do is that we're going to create uh, to do make the switch port port security and we're going to make the uh, to work with uh, uh, with dynamic dynamic learning and what we're going to do is maximum maximum and we're going to have one so that there is only one MAC address that can be uh, that can be allowed to com uh, communicate here. So next thing, we're going to, uh, we're actually not going to change the violation, or we're going to change the violation mode because this is a training exercise. So we do switch port port security, a violation, and I guess we can do restrict, and we have hit enter. So what we're going to do next is that we're going to send a ping from PC1 to PC2 using the simple PDU here. And the reason why I'm doing that is to enforce some traffic here. So now if we do a end and we do a show port security interface, uh, interface fast ethernet 01, we can see that we have port security enabled, the status is up, the violation mode is restrict as we configured, and we have, uh, we allow one MAC address and we also learned one MAC address. We can also see the lost source MAC address here. So this would, we can also do a show port security address. So these, this is the addresses that we've learned. We have some dynamically configured MAC addresses here. Since they are dynamically configured, if I go do show run, 
uh, or show run, they are not going to be in the running configuration as you see here. Uh, so now, uh, the last thing we're going to do is to make those learned sticky. So we go again to configuration terminal, and then we do our interface range fast ethernet one two, and we do switch port port security uh, MAC address sticky. So now the uh, now the MAC addresses should be learned sticky, and if we go do show run again, we can see that. They are not saved in the running config. Okay, they should be. According to the material, they should be, but whatever, let's move on. So what I just finally wanna show you is that if I change the cable here on PC2 and I connect the Rogue laptop to PC2, now if I try to send a ping from PC1 to PC2, we have in progress and then we have failed. And that is because the route root laptop comes in with a new MAC address and we only allowed one MAC address to be here. So this is a violation. And restrict as well as the other violation mode will not forward traffic when we have disallowed MAC addresses. So that's actually it for this demonstration. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I hope you learned something. Uh, let's. And next time when we get back, we're going to discuss how we can virtually separate networks using virtual local area networks known as VLANs. So until next time, have a good day.